Hey everybody, it's Pastor Dan with another study from Paul's letter to the Galatians. Fighting for freedom, the freedom of the Christian who knows that he or she is found in Christ and that our relationship with God is based on God's grace, not on his rules and laws that that we have to uphold in order to like make ourselves right with him. But instead, he makes us right through his grace. That's justification. That's the, uh, the doctrine by which the church stands or falls. Uh, and, and that's the not guilty verdict from a holy God who expects perfection, but he finds perfection in us through our faith in Christ. This has been the message of Paul um, in the letter to the Galatians. And remember, when he's talking to the Galatians, he's talking to young Christians. By that, I mean they haven't been Christians for long. So they're, they're baby Christians. And, and they're just starting to embrace this great truth. And it, and it is bearing fruit in their lives but not long after Paul brought them the gospel, uh, false teachers came among them and started to tell them things like, you know, you're not really a child of God unless you Gentiles become like the Jews and you embrace all of the Jewish customs and all of the Old Testament ceremonial laws, that's the only way that you're going to be in God's family. And Paul says, no, that's all wrong. Your, your place in God's family is through Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what your uh, nationality is. Um, it doesn't matter what your heritage is. Your place in God's kingdom is through faith in Jesus Christ and, and nothing else. And so Paul has been appealing to these uh, young Christians throughout the letter. Why? Because he's so afraid that they will actually lose their faith. Which is the worst thing that can happen to a human being that you could lose your faith in Jesus Christ by starting to put your trust in other things for your salvation. So Paul time and again makes um, very emotional, affectionate appeals to them not to turn their back on Christ. And what we're gonna be looking at today is another one of those and it's an appeal from Galatians chapter 4, verses 12 through 16, that touches on one of the great byproducts of believing the gospel of Jesus Christ. When God the Holy Spirit makes you a believer, there is joy. There's joy in your heart. And that doesn't always show itself in kind of like a, a bubbly happiness. But there is a joy, a contentment, a security, a feeling of love between you and God that's going to show itself in the way that you treat others. And Paul says to them today, I remember that. I remember you had that. You had that when I first brought you the gospel. What has happened to it? Um, and so this this section today shows us one of the uh, one of the the terroristic factors of of false teaching is that false teaching can snatch away your joy as it as it causes you um, first of all to who think of real gospel teachers and preachers as the enemy. So that's something that was happening with the Galatians. They were being led to, to look at 
the uh, Paul as the enemy rather than their friend. And another thing it does is if, if you are turned by false teaching into this idea of, of saving yourself, well, then you got to look at your spiritual life almost as a competition. Like you're scratching and clawing to make yourself better than somebody else so that God will love you. And um, that is not a joyful way to live. So today, Paul says, oh, my dear Galatians, what happened to your joy? Let's give a listen. So we'll start with uh, verses 12 through 14 of chapter 4. I plead with you, brothers and sisters, become like me, for I became like you. You did me no wrong. As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. And even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. Paul appeals emotionally to the Galatians based on the gospel joy they used to have. He says, I plead with you. In the Greek, it's uh, literally, I beg of you. Um, and you don't hear Paul talk this, uh, this often to human beings. Now, every once in a while in his epistles, you'll read this Greek verb, I beg of you, when he's praying to God. But here he's really, he's pleading with uh, fellow Christians, and isn't it, it, it really sounds to me like kind of the, the words of a, of a wounded father, you know, um, who's very, very concerned about his, um, let's say his teenage children and that they're going down the wrong path. And he's tried everything. And he just begins to plead with them. And he says, I plead with you, brothers and sisters, become like me, for I became like you. So what would Paul be asking them to do there? Become like me. When you put it in the context of the rest of this letter, isn't Paul saying, you know what I am? I'm a recovering Pharisee. I am somebody who who threw off the shackles of seeing God as like this system of rules and regulations and laws that I had to follow in order to prove myself better than others. I, I, I'm not like that anymore. I'm a recovering Pharisee. Become like me. Throw off the shackles of the false teaching that has, that's being spread among you, that you should um, see God as one who must be appeased by your performance. I became like you, Paul says. Now, it's hard to know exactly what he means there, but I've always thought this is a reference to what something Paul would later write in 1 Corinthians 9 where he, he kind of described or summarized his mission work methodology by saying, I became all things to all people so that by all possible means I might win some. And in that passage in 1 Corinthians 9, he says, um, I became, let me make sure I have this right here. I became like one not having the law to those who did not have the law. And see, that's exactly who these Gentile Galatian Christians would have been. They would have had no idea about um, Old Testament customs, um, 
Jewish heritage. They, they wouldn't have had any idea of that. And what Paul is saying is, when I did mission work among you, I purposefully put aside my preferences, my heritage. I, I set that aside in order to be like you so that I could bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to you because that's the most important thing. So become like me for I became like you. And then at the end of verse 12, he says, you did me no wrong. And um, again, this just to me sounds like a father talking to a child. And, and basically he's saying, you know, the reason I'm talking to you this way, it's not because it's not personal. Like, like I'm not, I'm not offended by your, and I'm not personally offended by your entertaining these false teachers. I'm worried. So you did me no wrong. I'm not talk. If I am talking tough in this letter, it, it's tough love because I'm concerned about you. It's not because I'm all hurt, but rather um, I'm concerned for your soul. Verse 13, as you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. Now, what I'm going to say about this is really an educated guess because we don't, we don't really know exactly what he's talking about with this illness. But I think we can take a scripturally educated guess. Our first clue is when he says, when I first preached the gospel to you. So now we know these are the Galatian Christians. We know the first time that Paul preached the gospel to them was in what we call the first missionary journey of Paul. And so if you go back, if you read about that in Acts chapter 13, 14, the first time that Paul came to um, the region called Galatia, it was from uh, sailing from the island of Cyprus in the Mediterranean Sea. And when he got to Asia Minor, he wasn't in Galatia yet. He was in a city called Perga. And it wasn't in Galatia, it was in a region called Pamphylia, right next to Galatia. Now, this was right at the sea coast, so it was the lowlands. There was no altitude there. Um, and in Acts chapter 13, all we're told in the account there is that Paul rather quickly left the lowlands and went up to Galatia which would have been higher in altitude. Okay, so that we, we know for sure. He left the lowlands to go to the highlands. What we know for sure is he talks about an illness. He says um, later on in this section, no, actually in this verse, he says, as you know. So they would have been well aware of this physical illness that he had that sort of drove him up to the highlands. Later in this section, he'll talk about how the, the Galatians loved him so much that they were willing to, and he, he uses these words, they would have torn out their eyes and given them to him. So there must have been something, unless he's just sort of using some kind of a hyperbole, but maybe, just maybe, this illness that Paul is talking about that drove him from the lowlands to the highlands really affected his eyesight to the degree that you could see it. Like you could, you could see how his vision was failing. These are all signs of malaria. And I think it's a pretty plausible um, 
story to say that uh, what Paul is talking about here with this illness is also the thorn in the flesh that he mentions in 2 Corinthians 12 that he had very early on in his ministry and that he he asked God to take it away and God said, well, no, I'm my grace is sufficient for you. You're going to be able to do all of the work that I want you to do with this thorn in your flesh. But the, the point here in, in Galatians is Paul is saying, do you remember that? Do you remember how, like, I was a basket case when I came to you, and yet you received me as if I was an angel. You received me as if I was Christ, as, as, as if I was Christ himself. Why? Because of the message he brought. See, that's the power of the gospel. And when the Holy Spirit works through that gospel to create Christian faith in, in somebody's heart, they will look past all of the things that they, I don't know, they might be offended by in the messenger, and they'll focus on the beauty and the power and the comfort of the message. And that's what happened with the Galatians. Like they just, it, you didn't treat me with any contempt or with any scorn, Paul says. I mean, I, back then, we're talking about the first century. We're talking about people that were at the time um, worshiping in pagan temples. Um, if they would have, Normally, if, if, if they would have seen somebody who was like perhaps, um, you know, visibly, visibly affected by malaria or some other terrible disease, they, they would have, um, they would have thought, oh, this man has an evil spirit. You know, we need to reject him. We need to stay away from him. But you see, that's the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because Paul brought them a message that they had never heard before. And when they heard it, that's when God worked on them. And God worked on them to the degree that even though his illness was a trial to them, that's, that's what he says here. So even though they could have easily been, I don't know, outwardly put off by this illness, they weren't because they just wanted to hear about Jesus. That's the power of the gospel. And, and boy, does Paul remember that. You know, he just has such an affectionate longing for those days. So then he says in verse 15, Where then is your blessing of me now? So, you used to have such joy in your heart. You, uh, Where is your blessing of me? Where is your joy now? I can testify that if you ha could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. They were such convinced Christians and so happy that the that the Lord brought Paul into their lives, that they would have become organ donors right there on the spot. I mean, that's the that's the the point that Paul is making. It's just to to speak to the high level of joy that they had and appreciation for Paul. <laughs> 
as being the man that brought them the gospel. And then he goes on to say, Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Doesn't he sound like a dad again? Like, am I somehow your enemy? By telling you what is reality? What is the truth? Maybe that's what the false teachers were saying to the Galatians. Maybe they were saying, you know, Paul has changed. He doesn't like you anymore. In fact, you can tell he doesn't like you because he didn't give you the full message. And the full message is that you got to get circumcised and you got to live according to dietary laws and you got to keep the Jewish calendar and that's how you're going to make yourself right with God. Then you'll be okay. But Paul never told you that. You see how the Judaizers, the false teachers, they were turning Paul into the Galatians' enemy in their own hearts. And Paul's kind of agonizing question is, is that what, is that what's happening simply because I told you the truth? You know, um, that's one of the big things that I'm taking out of this reading today is how both the truth of law and gospel often irritate our sinful nature. By that I mean law. The, the message that we cannot save ourselves. That our goodness is not good enough with God. That message, especially when we hear it from somebody else, is biblical, but it often irritates us, rubs us the wrong way. And then the gospel, the message that you only have one Savior and that um, he's the only Savior you need. And then that start see, and then that shoves aside any, any, anything else in our life that we think can save us, including our own goodness. So you see what I mean by the proper teaching of both law and gospel can be irritating to the sinful nature. So have I become your enemy by telling the truth? And then this is, this is another thing I'm taking away from this. Um, what a great example the Galatians were in those early days of not being put off by the messenger so that they didn't listen to the message. And uh, this is so very important for every Christian, myself included. Like I have to get past whatever uh, personal feelings I might have about another individual, when they are speaking the word of God to me, I have to listen to that word. In Christianity, the message, not the messenger, is the important thing. And as a pastor who regularly proclaims the word of God, I'm always thankful for people who listen to it despite my weaknesses and and despite whatever thing you know personal habits or whatever that I might um, that might normally get in the way of your listening to me. And so to develop within our Christian community this idea that it's the message, not the messenger that counts 
that's a that's a really important thing in the the second congregation i served um back in the 90s in in uh, marietta ohio um there there was a man one day who uh after church said to me reverend I didn't much like what you said to me today, but I needed to hear it. And I couldn't ask for a better thing to be said after a church service. You know, being honest about maybe not liking, personally not liking the message because it could have rubbed against our sinful nature, you know, and caused some irritation. But then he said, I needed to hear it. And that's the way it is with the truth, right? And that's the term that Paul uses, the truth. The truth can hurt, but we need to hear the truth. And we should be thankful for people who tell us the truth. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you have sent people into our lives over the years who have spoken the truth to us. Right here and now, we repent of all of the times that we allowed our personal preferences to get offended by the message of the truth. Instead, give us hearts that are open to hearing every bit of your word because you are a good shepherd that truly cares for us and truly wants to guide us and feed us and protect us. Grow us up into being faithful missionaries, speakers, proclaimers of your word, never afraid to speak the truth, even if we get a little bit of negative feedback. Lord, we, we bow before you today, thanking you for speaking your gospel truth into our hearts. Amen. God be with you, everybody. We'll see you again next time.